By the time this motion picture is over, the world will have 3,800 more human beings to feed. That's a gain of about 70 million persons a year. In 1850, there were only 1 billion people on Earth. In 1930, 2 billion. In 1960, 3 billion. And only 16 years later, in 1976, we passed 4 billion and still exploding. Look at the year 2000. A world population of six billion people is predicted. Frightening? It is when you relate it to the world food supply because our food situation is growing extremely precarious. To date, world agricultural production is keeping pace with population growth. But the two are on a collision course. The lines will cross in about 1985. So if we're to feed the growing multitudes, we must have a massive increase in agricultural production. Think about this. If world population doubles, can agriculture double its output? That's the question that faces everyone concerned with feeding the world. And that's the challenge for North Dakota agriculture. Basically, agriculture is a food and fiber system. It is a protein factory that transforms energy radiated by the sun into usable energy for mankind. Every morsel of food you eat begins in a growing plant. Some of it is further processed by animals, but the basic transformation of energy is done in green plants by a process known as photosynthesis. 93% of the incoming solar energy is reflected back to the atmosphere as heat waves, like those that distort the grain elevator and train in this scene. Of the 7% left for agriculture, 2% is used by the plant's own growing process. The remaining 5 is stored in the dry matter of the ripened crop. With the roots, stalks, and stems removed, only one or two percent of the total solar energy remains for human consumption. Because cereal grains lack some of the essential amino acids necessary to support human life, man needs more than bread alone. He needs animal protein found in milk, meat, poultry and eggs to supply the amino acids that will complete his nutritional requirements. Nature has adapted the ruminant or cud chewing animals in a unique way. Sheep and cattle convert the low quality vegetable protein of rangeland grasses growing on land unsuitable for tillage into high quality animal protein. The conversion ratio is about 8 to 1, which nets man only about 1% of the total incoming solar energy. When horses provided the motive power for farming, a large part of the harvest went to feed the animals. Man got the remainder. The first farm tractor was steam powered. It burned straw, coal, or wood. It didn't replace the horse, and it still took lots of human labor to farm. The introduction of the gasoline tractor started the shift from labor-intensive farming to an energy-intensive operation. As the years went by, the percentage of America's labor force engaged in farming declined steadily, but agricultural productivity increased sharply, due in part to the infusion of great amounts of fossil energy into the agribusiness process. Fossil energy enters agriculture in many ways. Diesel fuel and gasoline power most farm machinery. Pesticides made from petroleum control weeds and insects. Chemical fertilizers made from natural gas boost crop yields. 
and electricity, produced mainly from coal, does hundreds of farm chores. So today, the North Dakota farmer feeds nearly 50 people with the help of science, electricity, and fossil energy. The agriculture of North Dakota is somewhat determined by three distinct physiographic areas, the Red River Valley, the rolling drift prairies, and the Missouri Plateau. The state is split into two drainage areas by a continental divide. The Missouri River area drains to the south, the Red River north to Hudson's Bay. The flat Red River Valley, an ancient lake bed, is a general farming area with a diversity of crops. The rolling drip prairies are generally thought of as the wheat and barley producing area. And the semi-arid Missouri slope area specializes in livestock production. The American bison, a bovine ruminant, existed for centuries on the rangeland of North Dakota, so it's natural that cattle should be raised easily in this area. The raising of cattle on rangeland requires very little fossil energy, only sunshine and rain. The range grasses are annually renewable, and the calves born each year need very little supplementary feed. two and a half million head of cattle and calves in North Dakota, valued at about half a billion dollars. Working cattle has not changed much in the last century. When the range cattle are shipped to feedlot operators for fattening, the fossil energy input increases. They are fed corn, either as grain or as silage. Row crops are more energy intensive than cereal grains. The energy cost for the feeding operations must be considered an energy subsidy to the beef animal. The consumer's demand for well-marbled beef dictates this finishing process. Some animals are raised in confined pens on concentrated rations, swine and poultry, for example. Sheep were once a major source of food and fiber. But petroleum-based synthetic yarns have changed the market demand for natural wool. Harvesting a crop of wool is one operation that hasn't been highly automated. It still takes specialists. When the sheep shearing crew sets up its trailer on the ranch, the whole farm family joins in the operation. A good operator can shear over 200 sheep a day. Sheep raising is a moderately labor intensive industry suited to the terrain and grasslands of the southwestern part of the state.
The marketing of livestock is either by private treaty or at public auction. All kinds of animals are bought and sold at 28 sales barns located all over the state and a terminal market in Fargo. There are buyers for all of them, even saddle horses, for the western part of the state is cowboy country. Because of the size of the livestock industry, the second largest use of land in the state is for production of hay and forage. Alfalfa is a major hay crop. Oats and barley are important livestock feeds too. There are three major oil seeds grown in North Dakota, flax, for linseed oil, soybeans for cooking and margarine, and sunflowers, the new glamour crop worth about $54 million to the economy. Because bees are used to pollinate sunflowers, honey production is up to about 8 million pounds per year and growing. Potatoes for chipping and seed are a prime crop in the northern Red River Valley. Sugar beets also thrive in the rich Red River Valley soil. But the major farm product is wheat. 70% of it is high protein, hard red spring for quality bread products. The remainder is amber durum for quality macaroni and spaghetti. 21% of the tillable acreage in the state is devoted to wheat. Wheat has been the traditional crop since the railroads opened up the Dakota Territory for development. A town with grain elevators would spring up every five to ten miles along the railway line. This was the distance a farmer could easily haul wheat to market. The early farmers lived in sod houses, for lumber was scarce in the treeless prairies. It was a tough, rugged life. But the Dakota land was good to them. The fertile land produced the spectacular bonanza farms of the 1880s. They were large-scale farms with wheat as the major crop. The Red River Valley was called the breadbasket of the nation. All agriculture in those days was a labor-intensive operation. Today, many North Dakota farms are actually larger than those bonanza farms of yesteryear, yet they're operated as a family enterprise. Wheat is still the major crop, but the methods certainly have changed. Technology and petroleum energy have enabled the farmer to do much more work than his predecessors, and to do it in a dust-free, air-conditioned environment. Harvesting in horse agriculture days sometimes lasted till winter. The threshing crew worked long hours. For then the grain was cut by binders, piled in shocks so the seed would cure, then collected in wagons and threshed. A header eliminated the shocking and bundle collection operation, but it still took a lot of hand labor. Today, Many North Dakota communities annually relive the good old days of agriculture. 
Even the state's governor, a farmer who remembers how, joins in this bit of nostalgia. Today, in the energy-subsidized agriculture, if one combine can harvest 40 acres in a day, two can do 80. And four can do a quarter section. Sometimes the harvest comes in so fast, the grain elevators fill and become temporarily plugged. Transportation is sometimes not available to haul it away fast enough. Here's a half million bushels sitting in the open. Contrast this seeding operation of the 1920s with this one of the 70s. A tractor and machinery size revolution is taking place. Tractor horsepower is getting bigger, doing more work per unit of energy expended. By working day and night, it's possible to seed thousands of acres with a minimum of extra manpower. Planting sunflowers and other row crops can be done on a small scale or a grand scale. Farming operations of this size are the exception rather than the rule. But the aim of the agricultural industry is to increase production efficiency, produce more food per dollar, per horsepower, per man. CAD-mounted electronic equipment monitors the seed spacing and general operation of the machine. Just moving from field to field requires big, power-assisted machinery. An hour saved here and there is money earned. Tractor builders are setting the pace for the machinery makers. Here's a 750 horsepower experimental tractor. It's just loafing along. Experimental tractors are not confined to the manufacturers. Here's some home builds at a competitive tractor pull. has also become much more innovative. Once it was a labor-intensive job requiring many men. Today the manufacturers are producing machinery for one-man operation. Many different methods, but all designed as work savers. The total expenditure of agricultural production up to the farm gate takes only three and a half percent of the total energy consumed in the United States. That's actually less than jet aircraft use. But it takes three to five times that much energy for subsequent processing and to transport food to the consumer's home. The sugar beet crop is one North Dakota ag product that is not shipped out of the area for processing. Six refineries are located along the Minnesota-North Dakota border. Every year they process nearly half a million tons of sugar. 
The transformation of solar energy into human food, agriculture, is an immense and highly complicated industry, an ever-changing, never-ending scene. North Dakota has two important products, its agriculture and its youth. Future farmers of America combine the two. Each summer, the state FFA holds its state convention at North Dakota State University. The university has been a part of the agricultural scene since 1890. It's located on a 2,100-acre campus with over 7,000 students enrolled in a broad spectrum of studies. But NDSU does more than educate. It operates the state's agricultural experiment station, and it is a home base for the state's cooperative extension service. The Agricultural Experiment Station is a collection of laboratories, greenhouses, and research plots that have had a tremendous influence on your daily living. For example, your bread, cereal, and macaroni probably had their genetic beginnings at the NDSU Experiment Station. The same may hold true for the decorative flowers in your home. Agriculture would remain static without systematic research. So thousands of experiments are conducted each year to improve the methods and materials of farming. At Fargo and seven other stations around the state, research is done on a year-round basis. At Langdon, for example, the Durham breeder supervises the planting of 22,000 different genetic crosses. Chances are that one of these single heads of grain will someday be a new and better macaroni on your table. The experimental grains are harvested by hand, and the most promising types are increased for further testing. When a new variety is ready for release, the seed is increased by the experiment station to supply foundation seed for area farmers. It takes about seven years to develop a new variety. All tests are repeated at most field stations to check the adaptability to the area. If you attend an annual field day at any experiment station, you can be brought up to date on the research being done by the university, and you can get a close-up of the people who farm North Dakota. The extension function of NDSU puts the findings of the research scientist into the hands of the farmer. Where the experiment station is the farmer's research and development department, the extension service is his communication line with the university. You'll find extension specialists at every fair. Perhaps they're judging livestock, overseeing a 4-H tractor driving competition, or managing a barbecue at a field day. The Extension Service publishes a long line of educational materials on a wide variety of subjects as a public service to everyone. At a field day, you might find a specialist in fertilizer conducting a mini-seminar on anhydrous ammonia application. He is sharing information that research has proven to be fact. The latest energy-saving implements, such as no-till drills, are introduced. A group of soil scientists explain the research being done to relieve saline seep damage to cropland. Another group demonstrates deep plowing techniques to stop sodic soil buildup. Just bring potato farmers up to date on disease control methods. Proper animal waste disposal is a subject for a special farm tour. Livestock management procedures are also discussed. 
as well as different methods of irrigation. But the real contact with the extension service is through the county agricultural agent, who is the university's day-to-day -day contact with our agrarian population. The county agent, you will find him counseling farmers or instructing a 4-H group. The county agent has access to all research findings conducted by the experiment station. For example, pesticides. Leaves damaged by disease or eaten by insects are no longer available to convert the sun's energy to food and fiber. Of all the energy expenditures for North Dakota agriculture, probably the most profitable return is that used for weed and insect control. It has been estimated that without pest management, it would be impossible to feed the present world population. For example, a moderate infestation of wild oats can cause a 30% yield reduction. Hand labor weeding is only economical on certain crops. Tillage methods of control require about five times the energy of chemical methods. Potatoes are an example of the use of systemic pesticides in insect control. Before planting, seed potatoes are treated with an insecticide that will be absorbed by the growing plants. This is an energy conserving procedure which saves spraying the fields later with insecticides. The toxicant works its way into the leaves of the growing plant, killing the bugs that feed on them. Many farmers do their own pesticide application or hire a professional applicator. In addition to weed control, the aerial applicator applies insecticides and fungicides to control insects and plant diseases. focused on only a microscopic segment of North Dakota agriculture. It's big, fascinating, complicated, and it's the backbone of all our wealth. This is our stadium. It's homecoming and it's filled to capacity. In the time it takes to play a football game, the world population gains enough to fill these stands once again. And this increase is going on night and day, year in, year out. Those of us who are concerned with the strategy of agriculture must intensify research and development as never before, because the world's ability to produce food is growing at a considerably smaller rate than the world population is exploding. Our mission in agriculture as a university is to train scientists, conduct research, and inform farmers. This is our role in improving the world food supply, as well as the quality of life for all mankind. Mm -hmm.